Welcome back, everybody, to the CF Podcast. I'm Clint, and today we've got Jason with us. What's going on, folks? And we've got our man, Kevin Brittingham of Q, with us today. Good to see you, and thanks for joining us, man. Good to see you. So, so you've heard of us now. Uh, huh? uh, well, yeah, so, all right, so I already know where we're going, because as soon as I meet <laughs> you, dude, it's going to be good. Dude, you guys are going to enjoy this one. As soon as he comes in, he's like, so your top five 300 blackouts, huh? I'm like, um... Oh, shit. Yeah, that was the one that I recorded on a very busy day. Thank you, Ryan. And quickly throwing lists together. And understand, we've got sugar weasels. We've got honey badgers. Mm-hmm. And, and I, he's mm-hmm. like, so, but, but let me explain. And uh, we get complacent with a lot of what we shoot. Mm-hmm. And it's like, man, when I did that top five 300 blackout list, I was like, oh, shit. It wasn't, it wasn't until the comment section. I'm like, dude, where's the honey badger? And I was like, <gasps> I forgot all about the honey badger. Not even an honorable mention. So, look, Not man. even a mention of why you're talking about 300 blackout. <laughs> yeah, you know, and there's another thing right there. Believe me, I know, and we're going to get into all of that. But hear me out. I'll say it right now. It should have at least been, I'll give it, I said it uh, should have at least been number three. All right? All right? And I'll say it right here. I just want to see his face. <laughs> He's like, I'm going to need another sip. Mm. <laughs> all right, well, let's get into this, man, because first of all, you're right. If it wasn't for you, would 300 Blackout even be around? No, because I know because I was there when I named it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, dude. So, all right. So, I've, I've gone into a little bit of the deep end or a little bit. I'm not going to say the deep end, but the history a little bit of 300 Blackout and how you, and why you developed it. Because we know that the United States Navy, they love their MP5s. They love 9 mil, things like that. But they needed something that was just a little bit more efficient. And would you, can you elaborate about that? Well, this was um, early in the war, and we were making all the silencers for one of their groups. And they were working with 300 Whisper. And they had already kind of gone down the road. They wanted the AK cartridge in their 416s. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they had tried some of that, and it wasn't working very well. And they had contacted J.D. Jones, who originally did the Wildcat 300 Whisper. <coughs> Excuse me. And, you know, essentially that's a 2-2-1 fireball case with a 308 bullet in it. Yeah. Um, so very similar to a 223 case. The problem is he's using 308 projectiles. But what had happened is this group had built a dozen or 20 guns, and three of them were reliable. Shit. And Remington was in the process of buying my company, and they wanted to know if we could look at it. Mm. And... That's how it started. I probably wouldn't have looked at it had it not been for him. A year or two before, Johnny Noveski had sent me an upper for my AR and some whisper ammo, and I'd been shooting at some hunting with it. Um, but I didn't think a lot about it other than that. Johnny liked it a lot. And so we looked. We told him we'd look at it, and within a week or so, we figured out, okay, it's just the o job. Shape the bullets wrong. The bullets are too short, so when you load the cartridges, too much room in the magazine, right. all this sort of thing. So we developed bullets the right shape in O-Job, and that's sort of how it becomes 300 blackout mm-hmm. and because of the overall length requirements and stuff. And I knew within a couple of weeks it would be successful. Mm. Uh, silencers were getting very popular, and it's kind of like a modern 30-30. And, you know, you have super and subsonic. Now we have an AR you can shoot that's super quiet. But what they wanted was... Really, they were using, the Navy was using a lot of short barrels, Mm -hmm. and they're still using, you know, M855 or whatever ammo at the time. And so they wanted something more effective out of a short barrel. And the AK round's better. Mm -hmm. And so a 30 caliber bullet, and that's what they did. And they wanted subsonic capabilities. The Navy's always been pretty progressive with silencers. Right. And that's what it was. We started working on it, and they bought uppers from uh, my old company, Advanced Armament, mm-hmm. originally, and they picked the barrel length of nine inches, yeah. and then we did 12-inch uppers for them, and then ultimately they just bought firearms, complete firearms from us, which, mm-hmm. which they still use today. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. So it's it's neat to get into the history of that, because I'm a huge fan of 300 Blackout. I, yeah. I love the cartridge, and it's so fun to shoot suppressed. Subsonic 300 Blackout, I mean, I'm smiling now thinking about it, right? Yeah. It's fun. And it, it's, a, it's a good time, but then you think about how effective it actually is. You know, and so we know the Navy is doing their ship clearing and all that type of stuff. And, you know, and then you think about 5.56, five, when, you, when you shorten it that much, you're really losing the effectiveness of that cartridge. You know, now granted, it's still going to do a lot of damage. It's, it's still, still good. I mean, yeah. and there's projectiles now for yeah. that muzzle velocity sure. range. You know, mm-hmm. Barnes has a 70 grain or so. Yeah. And that's a great cartridge. Mm-hmm. And even their 55 grain solid copper is wonderful. So, I mean, yeah. you can compensate for it, right. but, you know, 
you are losing a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's still a great round, but oh, I mean, yeah, for me personally, for my guns for defense, they're mm. they're three hundred blackout. They're yeah. not five five six, and it has nothing to do with the fact that we were part of. You know, to me, we just facilitated a capability for an existing client. Yeah, and I was willing to really invest in it because. I had young children at the time, and mm. I saw having – we hunted a lot. We had a farm, and three kids. My kids are all just a year apart. Oh, well, and so yeah. they were at the time probably five, six, seven, six, seven, eight, something like that. Mm. And we could – we hunted a lot, and we had blind – hunting blinds on our property. And so I could take – them. we could take one gun and just collect – an AR collapse the stock to fit whichever kid it was, and they could shoot. You know, in 300 blackout super or sub with a silencer – there was no recoil, and it was effective for whitetail. You know, we hunted within 100 yards. Yeah. And it was great for that. And um, so I, I saw the commercial viability. Yeah. And so it was easy for me to tell them, yes, we'd work on it. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, it makes sense because you're now you're taking – you're pretty much taking all the T&E &E and the testings and everything for this military contract, able to apply that in a commercial market, and yeah. people love it. Right. Yeah. And so it's like it just it just made sense. Right. Now, that was the development of the cartridge. Yeah. And then now we get into – <clears throat> what should it, again? That should have been on the top five. Uh, yeah. The honey badger, right? And, yeah, and 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 before we even go that far, right? Because something that you know, when we first started getting Q products in, it was the trash panda, and we mm. saw the, the 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 you know the really dressed up you know um, uh, raccoon on the box and stuff, and just y'all's marketing is so good. It's it's funny. It makes you laugh, and then it's rememberable. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's it's so cool. So the name Q, you know, where does that come from? Nothing. I mean, it's, I mean, there probably is a reason. I don't think it's that important, but yeah. the real reason I started a company called advanced armament corporation, That's right. AAC in 1994. So mm. I was 19. Mm. And at the time the internet was sort of a new thing, mainstream right. at least. And I thought the name of the company needed to be very descriptive yeah. for search purposes back then. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And, um, you know, it turns out, not necessarily the case. So like 17 years of writing out Advanced Armament Corporation, and then you have AAC. That's not really cool. It doesn't mean anything. People always said ACC, the Atlantic Coast Conference. You know? <laughs> yeah. And then it's like not a logo. I, I don't know. So as time, I didn't like it. Yeah. And maybe like a lot of things in your life. When you're 19, you make decisions. And when you're 35, it's not the freaking decision you would make. You know. Right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, this was one of them. And so I ever, you know, the last five or six years, it's like if I ever have another company, have another opportunity, I want like Oakley, their O or the Nike yeah. swoosh. I want an icon. Right. right. And I want, because I want to be able to engrave it small, stamp it on parts, right. um, embroider it. Right. Uh, like you've got a pretty complex logo, you mm -hmm. know, so the, what's that, a bolt and CF and a crosshair. Yeah. Like if you embroider that small, it look mm -hmm. like shit. Yeah. You, you I think know. my shirt looks pretty good. You know, my dress shirt looks pretty good. You know, the, C yeah. the CF cog, it, it stands out. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, so I just think differently now. Yeah. And, and also, like, I didn't know for the rest of my life if it would be dedicated to small arms. Yeah. Right. So I didn't want it to necessarily be a gun. Like, sure. I might get into making sailboats. Right. Wow. You never know. Me. Right. And I just wanted something that was iconic yeah. that didn't really mean anything. Mm. And I think some of that's sort of a challenge, too. Like, I don't know. Like, I think probably abstractly a lot. And my willing suspension of disbelief is pretty strong. Yeah. So I've got a good imagination. but Right. And right. I sort of think in these terms, too. I, I, I just want something simple. Yeah. And it's our job to make the products. But it, it makes the name cool. So I don't need to name it anything. Right. Like yeah. I, you know, like I'm starting to do a line of flip-flops. i got a line of spirits coming out. Like things like this mm -hmm. that I partner with other companies. And so I don't, I don't know. I just wanted it to be simple and easy. Right. So you made what what I what I consider probably the perfect cartridge for CQB, and now all of a sudden you made it for different platforms that the Navy was requesting. So the Honey Badger, perhaps now you needed to make the perfect host for the cartridge. Well, what had happened was within SOCOM, there's different groups, um, and I was pretty excited. We got a military ammo contract. We yeah. got contract for uppers. Get a contract for guns. And I go to one of their kind of sister units or a cousin, whatever you would say, that we worked with and we supplied a lot of silencers and things to. Mm -hmm. I said, hey, yo, your cousin's 300 blackout in these uppers. How about you guys get some? And they're like, nah, we already developed a good 5.56 five, bullet for short barrels. I don't need that. Mm -hmm. I said, oh. They're like, you know, so 
They spend their time and energy where they want, and we spend ours. This sort of thing. I said, huh. But I worked closely with this group, yeah. and, and I knew their procurement process, and I knew their inventory and things like this. And I said, well, you got an MP5 SD that's still in inventory and issued, and life cycle was up 25 years ago. Mm. So what about if we build you a weapon yeah. based on this that meets that requirement so you don't have to run a new program, and you can just get this? Right. And, you know, you could have super and subsonic capability. Bam. Yeah, and that's how it started. And literally, just a few days later, I get the new requirement. Oh, wow. And these are groups that could sole source stuff, too. So yeah. that worked pretty good. And um, in two weeks, we had a prototype, the first prototype of the Hunting Badger. It was on a Nevesky lower. Mm -hmm. It had a, I forget what end that is. We mounted the aim point up way on the end. Yeah. We 3D printed the stock. Had Knight's Armament uh, trigger and, like, mag release and stuff in yeah. it. And we took it to them. The gun weighed four pounds. Oh, wow. And they had some, one of their units training. We went to the range. Some of the guys shot at some. We just told them quickly, look, MP5 SD, but here you get super and subsonic. Right. Yep. They shot it 30 minutes on the range. They're like, yeah, tell the guy in, in charge of the programs, yeah. And he sends us a, an order and for us to deliver, I don't know, 10 or 20 samples. Mm -hmm. And it kind of started from there. And that's, that's kind of how the Honey Badger was born. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's Well, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful gun, too. And it's not just another typical black gun on the market also. You guys no. got that, 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 I think it's like clear anodizing. Yeah. So yeah. we did clear anodizing. And, and originally the first one was standard gray, black, yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. And the engineers told me, they said, listen, all the guys like paint their guns anyway. Yeah. So clear anodize is the best anodize. Yeah. Um, cause all, all you do when you make a color is like you squirt a bunch of dye in it. So, right. so the anodizing process isn't quite as good as it would be if you didn't put the dye in it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they explained this to me and they're, I'm like, how's that going to look? And they said, well, the parts of it are going to be kind of gold and part will be gray. It'll be fine. Yeah. I was like, mm. And, but I let them do it for these guns and they look cool. Yeah. And they it just became known as a honey badger cause I go into engineering and they have the guns laying on the floor. Yeah. And they always had um, a projector with stuff playing I, while I, they worked. I know and it was that viral that video. Fair, like the honey badger don't care. Yeah, yeah. honey badger. <laughs> about that. And so I'm looking at and they wanted me to watch the video before I touched the gun. So I watch it. And that's just, we just named it. And so I couldn't never, I wasn't in the military. So I, it's hard for me to remember acronyms. Oh, yeah. And then, so and when you go to talk to these groups, half the time they're just speaking in acronyms. Yes. yes. So I nickname everything we've done. So yeah. we, so when we did the MCX at SIG, yep. which became the LVAW for the military, mm -hmm. I nicknamed it the Black Mamba yeah. because they had all these acronyms and stuff for it. And even internally at SIG, it the name changed like five times. Right. So marketing was fighting over the name. and <laughs> So I just gave it a nickname and I did shirts with the gun on it with a, with a Mamba like mm -hmm. wrapped around yep. it for all the guys working on the project at the yeah. time. and Yeah, I mean, that's how a lot of this happens. But, yeah. you know, it's like back to the name Q. It's funny because generally if I do a podcast ever interviewed, it's like the first question everyone asks, yeah. mm. which tells me that it's right. Because right. I also wanted it to be different than our industry. And it, and it is. You know, I'm not Daniel Defense. You're not going right. to see me with a mullet and, like, sponsoring race cars. Like, yeah, right. I, I didn't even name my son after me. I'm not yeah. going to name the company after me. Right. It's like it just – I want to – our stuff should be different. Mm -hmm. but it should also be honest and transparent. And yeah. I, I think it's where, and, you know, when I sold my company, Advanced Armament, to Remington, I was a yeah. company man. Yeah. I wanted to make Remington the greatest gun company in the world. Right. I wanted to be a part of that. And, you know, it's just my nature. Very loyal. That's how I am. And I, I, I want the company to outlive me. Mm -hmm. of and so I, I don't need to name it after me. Yeah. You know, like I, I know who the fuck I am. I don't need to name a company after me. And I just wanted something very simple and different, but it has to be honest and transparent. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the fact is, it's like I can hire a marketing firm to do all this research and pay them. But I find with marketing, when I go with my gut, it works. Yeah. And it's been so far, it's been like that with product for the most part. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So. Um, uh, for those that don't know, you obviously had your hand in the MCX and, and with SIG quite a bit. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, so we're in the middle of working on the Honey Badger program right. at Advanced Armament. This mm -hmm. would have been a huge deal for Remington because the Army, Big Army, was also working on PDW programs. That's right. Yep. Yep. And they were waiting 
for their SOCOM unit to do this. Yeah. So the potential for this was a billion dollars. Yes. Right. You know, because if that had worked out, there would be no submachine guns. B and T wouldn't be getting an army contract for a nine millimeter that weighs two pounds more than the honey badger. <laughs> and right. you know, and, yeah. and with that being said, like NATO, yes. there's right now NATO is given three hundred blackout a designation. So yeah. it's been adopted by our country, and now NATO is adopting it. Let's, right. Let's not beat around the bush. You are the godfather mm-hmm. of anything that runs quiet. If it wasn't for you stepping in and creating it, nobody would be chasing right you. And I, and I, I don't I don't know if you get the mm. the, I don't, I, the gravity of that. You started like a whole revolution of on that whole process. I I don't know. I mean, I think I played a part in like a renaissance of silencers. Correct. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and you could back that up to when I was 19. Like I shot, I never shot a gun with a silencer. I, I didn't shoot a gun until I was like 17 or 18 years oh, wow. old my whole mm-hmm. life. Yeah. And I, I started target shooting. And firearms were interesting to me at that time. Right. But I wasn't super into it. But I had an opportunity to actually shoot some guns with Navy SEALs. And it was just happenstance and and had five or six of the guns got to shoot some of the machine guns and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I got to shoot the MP5 SD. Yeah. And that's kind of where, and I just asked them, I was like, why don't all your guns have silencers? Mm-hmm. Right. And they didn't have a good answer for mm-hmm. me. And I was just fascinated by it. You know, I couldn't believe how quiet it was. Like the first round, I thought the bullet stuck in the barrel. And then, <laughs> oh, right. and then I heard it hit steel. Right. And I was amazed. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of started out on this quest about it and wanted to know more. And so I just fell in love with silencers. I don't know how to describe it. And I've described it this way in the past, but it was just became an obsession. And when I shot the gun with the silencer with the MP5 SD, it was the same, it's like it's the same feeling. Yeah. Yeah. I can remember the day. I remember the temperature. I remember yeah. like the rain. Like I remember just specifically so many things are just etched in my brain. Yeah. And there's been a couple other things in, in my life, but maybe only half a dozen total like that. Mm. And, and I just became really obsessed with it. And so, but yeah, when I started doing silencers and everything, like most of the gun stores at the time where I would try to sell the silencers to would tell me silencers were illegal and like kick me out of their store. Oh, And no. so that's what I had to find. And you think there wasn't like you young kids, y'all got social media and the internet. Oh, yeah. Like so, I had to run magazine ads and go to shows. Yeah. And you know, like there ain't a lot of people do that shit now. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, and my fear really was I didn't want a government job. I decided, and I didn't want to work in a factory like my parents. Right. And so I, I went on, um, pursued uh, a law degree, but ended up quitting because by then, after my second year, um, advanced armament was I was making more money than I could have made right. being an attorney. So it was like. And then also, like, spending time in court during that second year, I was like, this seems terrible. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I don't know. I mean, it just all just, it just happened. And, right. But, you know, looking back on it, and then when we talk about, okay, so by the time I'm 30, I have a lot of military contracts. Mm-hmm. And, like, I didn't even grow up liking G.I. Joe. <laughs> like, right. I, I didn't care. Like, you know, a lot of guys, and a lot of the guys that I would work with in these units, special operations units, they knew they wanted to be G.I. Joe when they were six years old. Those guys, there's a lot of them that are, I, I thought from the outside, not knowing them before this, that, oh, they'll all be the same and obsessed with guns. And half of them kind of are that way, I found over the years, or a third. And the other are, they're just special. And they yeah. would be good at anything they did. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them, half of them don't give a shit about guns. Oh, yeah. They yeah. don't know about guns. It's just a tool. Right. Like, yeah, they issue us this gun. I train it, train with it. I do what they say, and, you know, and this is it. Like, they don't think on how to make things better or anything right. like that. Um, so, hell, I don't even know where I was going with that. But it's just been, like, an interesting journey. Like, right. I, I didn't think, you know, this isn't what I set out to do. But, mm-hmm. you know, over time I found a passion. Oh, I don't know where I was going with that. So, but when I was 30, I remember some of those guys telling me, you know, is, is where I understood I wasn't going to have to ever have a job. Yeah. And so then I didn't, and I became friends with a lot of these guys. We'd ride dirt bikes together or, you know, I still have a half pipe. I've been skating my whole life. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them did that. And it's like, oh, they're not just into military stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I became friends with a lot of them. Yeah. And then it's sort of like it became, we had the street cred of having, having military contracts. 
but then they're just like, most of them are just normal guys too. And so mm. I related to them that way. And that's when I really started marketing the way that I wanted to, because like, I didn't need to conform to our industry or, you know, do what other gun companies were doing. Cause I, I generally don't like it. I still think most of our industry, the marketing sucks, like the creativity sucks. A lot of the products, it's just bullshit. Mm -hmm. And I'm only interested in like creative, innovative, like things that give you a new capability. Right. Yeah. That's what interests me. Like, listen, I never thought I'd have a million bucks. Mm -hmm. So like for me now, like I will never chase money again. Yeah. Like I, like I have enough money for my life. And the rest of it, I just want to continue to grow the company. And, and now as I get older, too, you know, my, my children are adults now. So, like, I fall in love with the, the families at my company. Yeah. And so it means something to me to continue and have a legacy for them in a place when I'm gone that they can retire from. And, you know, and I understand, too, my fulfillment isn't that I get a military contract right. or that I do something that's known. It is just doing things that are innovative and change our industry or hunting or mm -hmm. give the military guys a capability they don't have. And I learned a lot of that from 300 blackout yeah. and the silencers. Wow. And that's awesome. And in addition to all of that, you're, you are building that legacy, not only for your own family, but for those families that you just talked about that you, right. that you employ. Well, I, I mean, I'll tell you this, my company goes to my employees when I die. I'm not giving it to my family. Yeah. Like my kids aren't going to have happier, more fulfilling lives. If I could give them a bunch of money, right? No, like yeah, my, was... my kids have grown up privileged enough and, yeah. wow. and I love them. And, and if I had worked for my father, mm -hmm. I don't think I would be happy. Right. And I see a, a lot of my friends in this industry, they're a second and third generation. Mm -hmm. The only one I know it w worked out well for is Chris Barrett. Yeah. He, he handles it well. Yeah. Mm. And he's an awesome guy. He's one of my favorite people in the industry. Yeah. But if I thought that it would help my children, you know, I, I would, I would leave it to them. Right. But that wouldn't be the best for my company and it won't mm. be the, I don't believe it'll be the best for my children. Yeah. Like, they need to do their own things. Yeah, that's that's really honorable, honestly, because man for I the mean, people, bro. I mean, well, yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's fantastic too because you're not you're not raising somebody then just to do what, right? You know, like you're. you're yeah, I don't. I don't need to it. make my daughter's husbands rich. I probably, right. I'm probably not even going <laughs> to like them. Right? <laughs> right. You know, I mean, yeah. I just, I just think, in for my son, I think I know how I'd feel if I worked for my dad. Right. I have one son and two daughters, hmm. and. I know my friends in the industry that work for their dads the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of them. I know one of them that's happy. Yeah. Damn. And so, yeah. you know, I, I grew up with parents that were factory workers. So I didn't have someone to like a mentor to mentor me with this right. kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. I'm not handled a lot of it correctly with my family and stuff money. Cause you know, when you're poor, you think if I had money, it'd fix all these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't think that's the case. And, you know, I tell my kids, if they're pursuing legitimate education, I got you. Yeah. Or if they want to start their own business and they're passionate about it like I am, like, yeah. I got you. Mm. I'm not going to enable you to not suffer, you know, in a job you don't like or right. anything else in life. Because that's what builds their character. My kids need to know, like, that they are tough, that they can survive. To, you know, like, I will only do something I'm passionate about because I wouldn't survive the tough times in a job if I didn't like the job. Right. You know, so uh, yeah. So that, it, it is always surprising. People think like I want a legacy now because the company is not me. The company is, you know, especially our core group of people. And it's a yeah. lot of people that, that sacrifice a lot, you know, belong like my kids, they've had wonderful lives. <laughs> right. And you know, they didn't have to sacrifice to get yeah. So yeah. that's the way I, I feel about that. And, I, and my kids are on board. Like they don't expect it and they don't, mm. I've always been this way. That's awesome. Yeah. That, that truly is awesome. Yeah. And <clears throat> I will say this too, cause we've talked about a little bit of the development, why, why the 300 blackout cartridge exists, why the honey badger exists, you know, yeah. and shooting it, it truly is a fun thing. I will say this though, that the cherry bomb at the end, good God, you, you turn heads. Yeah. You turn heads with that muzzle device. Yeah. It's <laughs> right. horrible. You know, but, but man, you, you throw on, you know, uh, the trash panda and dude, it's like, it is a dream. It legitimately is a dream to shoot and you're not getting a lot of gas back to the face and everything like what, cause that's something too, you know, I've shot even, you know, nine millimeter 
sub guns. I'm yeah. getting gas back to the face, especially AR nines. M- MP5 SD is terrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, we, we shot that full auto one. You know, and it's it is like hey, hold your breath. You know, yeah. it's fun. Yeah. Don't get me wrong; it's definitely fun. <clears throat> oh yeah, but yeah, but you definitely you you, you taste freedom. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, as my children's all their favorite guns when they were really young. Yeah, and, and it's one of my favorites still. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, that gun was done 50 years ago. I know. It's right? crazy to think about how old that guy is. <laughs> yeah. well, question. Will Q ever make a 9 mil? A 9, nine mil? Gun? Uh, you know, he, here's the thing. This is where it's a tough one, right? Mm. Like, I don't like dealing with money, and I don't really like business and stuff that much. But it's obviously necessary to fund the things I want to do. Right. Easy money for me is to make a 9 millimeter honey badger because we would do it right, and it'd be awesome. Right. And, you know, and from there, okay, we learn from that. And that has a direct overlap with, you know, personal defense for you guys right. or hunting, mm-hmm. which I'm passionate about. Okay. Any of those things I am into. You look, I, you want to buy our guns and show them off on Instagram. God bless you. That's cool. It's marketing for me. I, I love it. Anybody that spends their hard earned money on my gun. I don't, I don't even care if it's trust fund money. Yeah. You spend money on my guns where I support my company. I am very grateful but I have no interest in taking up the limited resources, whether it be time, money, engineers, whatever, doing something that doesn't yeah. change. I can make the best nine millimeter submachine gun in the world. It doesn't change anything. Right? Mm. So it's just money. Like I could get money, but where I look at it now, I'm 50. Mm. Like how, how much longer can I do this? 25 years maybe? So we got tw- five years, we got probably seven major projects mm-hmm. for me to be involved in. And to me, a nine miller, nine millimeter sub gun's not one. And I love sub guns. I have a huge yeah. collection of sub guns mm-hmm. from, you know, the nineteen thirties basically on. Wow. Yeah. And but for us, it doesn't doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it would sell. I I, I get it. Yeah. I, I right. could I could buy a plane with that money. <laughs> <laughs> but but G five. Yeah. <laughs> that probably could. Yeah. But I mean, I I think I'm cheating. I, I'm cheating everyone if I do that. Honestly, I, th- I mm. think so. Okay. I mean, I'm not, listen, I I am not. I probably ain't the richest guy in this room, but I have enough money for my life. Right. And the rest of it to me is, it, you know, all my engineers, all, all the key guys could go any other company in this industry and make more money than they make working for me. But they're giving up all the freedom. Right. You know, we have so much freedom at my place. That's awesome. You know, I, I take those dudes to Africa once or twice a year and, and take them on a hunt that their their wives would never let them do. Yeah. You know, and um, I believe in them. I support them. I've never told them no for money for anything they want. Yeah. So if they want a million dollar 3D printer, okay. You know, wow. and you don't get, you go work at SIG's a great gun company. You go work there, you're working at a company with a lot of rules. Right. And they tell you what to do. Mm. And that's just not the way... That's not the way I work. Like we have a, actually Q is now, we, there's two divisions. We have a, a firearms factory, a facility, QC, assembly, range, test fire, manufacturing, machine, all that. And then three miles away, purposely three miles away, we have creative. And so that's sales, which I view as a creative process, actually. Mm-hmm. Marketing and design engineering. And they have their own machine shop in their own range. And they're totally separate. Hmm. And because, you know, I need them. They're the smartest guys in the company, and they can do everything. And when I started the company with 11 people, I think we had six degreed engineers. Mm. So that was six times the the number of engineers that, like, Daniel Defense had three Mm. years ago. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's one of their (laughs) one of our engineers, uh, Mitch Bruzy, he came to work for us from there. He was the only degreed engineer at Daniel Defense at the time. So that, and that was 2016 or 17. Whoa. So huh. wow. there, there's like the boom box will be a great example. Our okay. new gun in eight, six looks like a honey badger. It's just an AR. You can build one for $500, right? Mm-hmm. So sure. you see when the boom box comes out, how small lightweight that is, how far the industry, how, how far ahead we are of the industry, how mm-hmm. long it takes mm-hmm. for any company. I don't care how much money they have to develop a gun that competes with that gun. Because it's all the yeah. nuance. Like when you buy Q, when you buy a, a three thousand dollar gun for me, you're paying for that last five yards. Right. You're paying for the the last the last few percent because that's that's where you know that's where 
that's where it's tough, you know? Like, anybody can build a fucking AR or can build a bolt gun. Mm. Like, big deal. Right. Like, get that last 5% out of it. You know, there's a reason, you know, a Ferrari or an Audi or a Lamborghini costs more than a Corvette. Get, right. get that last 5%. We'll mm -hmm. see how much that thing costs. Mm. Mm. Wow. Super interesting. I am really excited for 8.6, though. You guys got to shoot it at the Active Crisis uh, <laughs> training. <clears throat> when I tell you, first of all, recoil impulse was nothing. It's 300 blackout. No, it was, yeah. it, it almost even felt like almost dampened to that. Like I, it, it just, there was, and maybe it was just because I was shooting offhand yeah. or, or, you know, just, uh, and it just, I was like, okay, try that again. I was like, oh my God, zero first round pop, zero. It's good. It, it's so much going, that, that reminds me of the silencers, you know, we're talking about silencers right. and, and we put so much into all of this. And, you know, flow through technology, this, this term that mm -hmm. OSS coined, yeah. you know, that started with the silencer that was on the gun that killed bin Laden. Because mm -hmm. those 416s, that contract, they weren't designed for, because the HK416 was built for the U.S. Right. right. And the contract, there was nothing about using it with a silencer. And that's why the first one's never had an adjustable gas block. And uh, then the silencer and in inventory at the time was a Knight's Armament can, the NT4, right. which yeah. is a great can. But you put it on there, the gun's not reliable because the gun runs so fast. HK is so good at manufacturing. Those guns are so slick that the gun runs so fast with the added back pressure that it skips over rounds in the magazine. The magazine can't lift the rounds as fast as it's going. It's traveling, oh, so it wow. skips over them. Yeah. So... We were awarded a contract for those, and it M4 2000 was a silencer we were making for the time for a mm -hmm. lot of groups. But we had to do what is now, it's captured flow through for those to work. So basically, we had coined ink and nail baffles in the silencer, yeah. and we had to perforate those until the end so gas could flow through okay. to lower the back pressure. pressure. And it's more less gas in the face. All that. So the only difference really is we don't port the front end cap. And so we'll start marketing some of the new silencers that are coming out still as that captured flow through. And that started then. That's interesting. And, but, you yeah. know, when you port that, the end cap, you know, like people rave about the, the Hux works now, or, yeah. which I guess was OSS right. or CGS. Oh, mm -hmm. those cans are so great. Well, they're complicated. They're expensive. They weigh 20 ounces and you get a flash the size of this table out of the muzzle. <laughs> and, you know, that CGS can... Or the Hux can, they're over 150 dB. Like, why the fuck would you put a silencer on your gun? Mm. Say, so, oh, well, you don't get gas in your face. Okay, well, you also have a muzzle flash, so you're going to get shot in the face. <laughs> and it's as loud as a 22 pistol. Like, a 22 pistol, mill standard sound testing is 152 dB, a 22 yeah. unsuppressed pistol. A 9 millimeter is only 156 dB. Like, first round on that little Hux K can, yeah. out of an 11 inch 5.56. Five, or the CGS can, or between those two numbers. So you, that's why you're wearing Peltors and you're shooting it. So like for me, <laughs> nobody loves silencers more than me. If I have to have 20 ounces, 15, 18 ounces on the end of my gun, and it's increasing muzzle flash, and I gotta wear Pel Peltors, like, mm -hmm. don't use a silencer, just put a good flash hider on there. Guess what, <laughs> you get no blowback, like, you're good. <laughs> So this whole thing is like this marketing, and they win this like one contract or whatever. What's that? The M one ten A one or something? Oh the, yeah, there's that one with the HXQD, right? Yeah, and so people cow. think, oh, well, the, the military, but that's what you should like. You fucking idiots! <laughs> like, <laughs> oh my fucking god! You know, it, it's it's so like all these Instagram kids get that one because that's what the military has. Right, the, right. There is nobody that shoots a bunch of people that has that silencer on their gun. I can promise you that. Like, that's just stupid. Oh. And <laughs> so we just take a different approach. Like, I'm not going to follow these trends and stuff. Right, right, right. But with 8.6, that's part of that as well. You know, it's a balance of the silencer. You don't need too much blowback, reliability, or gas in the face necessarily. Uh, but flash, flash is a big thing when it's right. real military. For, stuff. for sure it is. And, okay, uh, there's a lot of things you can do that aren't a silencer that will send the sound down range if that's what you're worried about. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know, I'd go off on this for days. But 8.6, <laughs> well, I was worried about 8.6. We started 8.6 just after 300 blackout. So my first 8.6 gun that we built was in 
2010. Yeah. Oh. And oh. it was started with 338 Federal. Okay. And 338 Federal is, is basically a 308 cartridge with a 30, 338 bullet in it. So inside 300 yards, it's better than 308 in every regard. Wow. But if you've ever shot one, the recoil is horrendous. Mm. But the case is too long to load big, long subsonic bullets in it, and it still feed an SR-25 mag. mags. Yeah. So that's where we started experimenting. We got back on it about three or four years ago, and we started shortening the case for big, long subsonic bullets. And it's like everything. If 300 blackout, if all you want to do is shoot supersonic, you should make the case longer probably and put more powder in it. Yeah. But then you don't have subsonic. Like uh, there's a 300 hammer or 762, something like that. Yeah. Somebody did. That's a supersonic on one. Yeah. And it's better than supersonic, but you have no subsonic. But so 8.6, we learned all this stuff. We started doing fast twists back then with the Honey Badger. Uh, we were just chasing subsonic accuracy with a rifle cartridge, so you got to spin the bullet much faster to get the RPMs up because you don't have the linear velocity. Right. right. Um, otherwise, you're going to shoot. It's like 308 subsonic sucks because the barrels are all one in ten, and you'll shoot an eight inch group at a hundred yards with subsonic. Yeah. Because you need to spin the bullet faster. Right. And with subsonic, you know you're limited by a linear velocity. So if you go over, depending on where environmental conditions. 1,000 to 1,150 generally, somewhere in there, you're going to get the ballistic crack, so you're limited. So then the only way to get the bullet spinning faster, to stabilize it, to get good dispersion, so make it accurate, right. is to faster twist. Right. And so we started doing that. And so we took that into consideration also with 8.6, and so we went all the way to one in one twist just to see what would happen. Oh, wow. Yeah. And one in one has a place actually, but then you're limited to subsonic only and some things like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, and once you start spinning real fast, the rotational velocity makes a difference on impact. If you go from a on energy, so if you go from a one in eleven to a one in nine, it's not that big a deal. Right. Yeah. If you have a small diameter bullet, it doesn't make that, that big a difference. Deal. But when you make a drastic change, like going down to one in three, now your your muzzle energy changes right and people argue like all the internet brilliant people will say well you don't calculate spin has the rpms have nothing to do with muzzle energy you know that's not how you calculate muzzle it's only because this the twist was always the same right and that's why and so you know when you think of terms like uh what is fast twist do you think you have multiple speeds on your blender well if twist doesn't matter why the hell do you have a high speed mm -hmm. you know or if if the the average adult man is 15 inches from here to here and i shoot you here with a one in ten twist the bullet turns one and a half times when it goes through you i shoot you with a one in three the bullet turns five times so the bullet expands and twists so think about all the arterial damage in the wound channel i just created by spinning it's it fast. yawing in your body yeah i mean it opens up to an inch yeah. and a quarter inch and a half and spins five times instead of one Jesus. so you start thinking in practical senses like this mind blown yeah yeah right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> like, like like hold on hold on hold on because you're, you're moving you're you're, you're, continuing, you're you're continuing the page and i'm sitting over here listening to you and i'm like my mouth is still like I just opening more and more and more like, Oh my God, you know, because this is the type of stuff. Again, we get caught up so much in, and see, this is, this is so funny because I, I say sometimes it's like, yeah, firearms have remained pretty much the same over a hundred years. You know no, what I mean? Exactly. And, right. And, and, and then, and then you start talking about like, but think about this. though, just the twist rate. Boop. All right. Let's just speed it up some and let's see what happens. Right. Well, and then you got the large diameter calibers that you're talking about. And, but this is really what happened. So I think I have the best engineering team and the smartest engineers in the industry work for me. I believe that. I also believe I could make a lot of guys in this industry that are smart the best. And it's not because I'm brilliant. I just love innovation, so I spend the money on that. Like, if I had a billion dollars tomorrow, I wouldn't even buy a new house. Like, I am good. I like my life simple. I like the complexity of work and I can't handle both parts of my life being complex. Mm -hmm. I want to solve those problems. I'm not great at my personal life. And what I have learned is I can't make it complicated because I'm not good at it. I'm good at my job. Right. And so it attracts smart people and I give them the freedom and I inspire them. I'm just pretty much like the little John a Q. You know, I'm just like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, I'm just DJ Khaled. <laughs> like, like, I'm not the one. 
I've had another one. <laughs> you know, and and I just cheer these guys on, and I uh, believe in them more than they believe in themselves. Right. But I need a constant entrepreneur. Like I'm always going to believe we fail. I'm always going to believe we can do anything in the world, and I put my money where my mouth is, which I think I'm more willing to risk than most people, because. The worst thing that happens to me, like, you can't even starve to death in America. So when people tell me they have a hard time, like, fuck off. Like, I live in Africa six months out of the year. Like, let me take you there. You got such a bad life. Let me let me show you how the rest of the world lives. I've been to Africa. And, like, I've you, seen it. Yeah, so you can't even starve to death in America. So if the worst thing I have to do is, like, move in with my parents again, <laughs> I get, like, free food and laundry. Like, <laughs> is that really hard? So, right. so I don't think in those kinds of terms. But – and I also understand – like, we can accomplish these things, and I believe it. And that's where I know, like, you know, you, you think about, I started doing this before I had anything to lose. Mm -hmm. And so risk is easy for me. Yeah. And, like, in my neighborhood in Atlanta where I had a house, you know, I live in the cul-de-sac, and I had a, a pro baseball player in my cul-de-sac. Mm -hmm. There was a guy, there was an orthopedic surgeon, there was an anesthesiologist, and there was a guy that owned funeral homes. They all had lots of money, and they were so jealous of my life. Because you know, you have freedom. I have freedom. freedom. That's what I have. But you know, if you're if you wait till you're 35 to take chances, you got a mortgage, you got kids, you got all these things. Like I had nothing. Like, I didn't have kids till I was 30. Like I, I was rich when I was 30. Right. So for me, like that part of my life has always been easy. Right. Um, and that's where I know, like, these other companies won't take these chances. Like, it's funny, me doing 8.6 blackout, every ammo company, when I did 300, told me it will not be successful. The commercial market won't accept it. There was not a single ammo company until I got that military contract that would make ammo. How about that? Hey, uh, uh, what about and, that 300 blackout? Yeah, right? <laughs> and it's like, right? and ammo is not even my job. And so you think, I go to ammo companies now, and it's like, okay, I got a resume, and we did 300 blackout, and this is the same formula that works. It's a barrel change only, full mag capacity, no new mags, no new bolt, barrel change only, super and subsonic, and it's lethal as fuck. And I still, I go into these <laughs> meetings with these ammo companies, and, you know, it's like they're too afraid to risk, and, you know, not invented here, and on and on and on. And... You know, you think, like, Hornady's very good at marketing. Like, Creedmoor cartridges, they're great. Now they're doing ARC, and that's taken off. And ARC is stupid, really. <laughs> like, ARC is, if you want to put it in a gas gun, okay, 6.8 SPC, why didn't it work out? Like, it's better at killing than 5.56 is by a long shot. Why, doesn't it, why, didn't, why didn't the military adopt it? 4.58 SOCOM? Why don't they adopt it? Okay, new mags mm. to go in the M4. They're not reliable. They're limited capacity. You have to open up the bolt face. The bolts break. Mm. That, that's why. That's why it sucks. Six arc is a cartridge. When you have ammo companies do it and they don't understand guns, I don't care if you squeeze like 300 Win Mag's a great cartridge. Mm -hmm. 300 PRC is a, is a better cartridge. Yeah. How much more, how much better is it? It's a few percent. Okay, but what gun do we put it in? You make them these weird links and all. Like, you have to have a delivery system. Do you have a detachable mag? Right. You know, what, what action link? Can you put it in a gas gun? There's all these considerations. And you get guys like bench rest shooters, the best shooters in the world. You know, they hand measure and load everything, and they have a 30-pound bench rest gun that they shoot 2,000 yards with or whatever. Like, who gives a shit? Right. It's like, it's like a lot of times, like... Um, what is that, PSR, PRS, whatever that right, right, right. precision P rifle shooting? Yeah, PRS. Like those guys, some of the best shooters in the world. Yeah. But there's like 200 of you. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't want a 20-pound, 6-millimeter gun. No. Like I, I carry my gun up mountains hunting. Right. I spend half my year hunting in the mountains. Like I don't give a shit about a 20-pound, 6-millimeter gun because mm. I'm not going to carry that thing with a 34-inch barrel or whatever they got. So I think with the industry too, there's a lot of just dishonesty and it's not the industry. Like I hate when companies lie to consumers. Yeah. Like if I tell you something about our products or the history or where this thing came from, I'm not going to lie to you because got to have credibility. Right. And I'm not going to lie to you for marketing purposes to sell our shit. I just won't. If I have to shut the company down tomorrow, I'm still fine. <laughs> um, 
I'm not going to do that. And I hate when companies, and that's why I call them out, and that's why I'm an ass. Mm-hmm. If whoever it is, name the company, they lie to a consumer about a product. Right. I don't even care if I'm friendly with you. Like, you're hurting the industry, so shut For the sure. fuck up, and I'll yeah. call you out. Right. But it's also, consumers are liars, you know, like it's online or whatever. And I say that in this sense. It's like how far people shoot things. Mm. Uh, animals hunting, the military. A friend of mine, he was in one of the most elite groups in the history of the world. And he was a sniper for 17 years in that group wow. during the war. So when I say the war, from 01 to 11, when everybody was getting killed. G-Y. <laughs> 200 yards as long as shot. Really? 17 years. Wow. And that's when they were shooting a lot of people. Right. And so everybody, everybody, every terrorist, every animal is shot. 99.9% are shot within 300 yards. So that's where 8.6 is that solution. 300 blackout, that's 100, 150 meters maybe. Right. 8.6, I've shot lots and lots of animals with subsonic over 250 meters. Mm. So 300 meter subsonic, and it's probably eight six blackouts. Probably legitimately a 600 meter supersonic cartridge. Yeah. My longest kill with it is 435, and that's with a 12 inch barrel. Nice. So, and and that's a 500 pound animal. And that's that's incredible. So when you think about it, you said a 12 and a half inch barrel over 12 inch barrel, yeah. 435 yards, supersonic five pound gun. Yeah, with on a, on a 500 pound target, you said. Yeah. Yeah, that's impressive. Wow. And 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 five pound gun like i mean yeah bro and the, the best part of that story is my buddy i was telling you about 17 years in the socom unit as a sniper 200 yards longest kill yeah. he just went with me to africa hunting on my last trip he hunts with that gun a couple of days he mm. takes it and he says how far did you shoot that wildebeest i said 435 he comes in that day he shot a wildebeest at 440 <laughs> so he was at 400 and backed up so he could shoot it farther than that. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to get that one up. You yeah. Know? <laughs> How cool is that though, man? So I, I just, it's, I, I'm kind of baffled still, you know, <laughs> like, like the entire, like, like getting to the 8.6. Cause again, I haven't even shot it yet. You, Ryan, yeah. a couple of you guys got to, got to shoot it and everything. And I'm really excited about that. Is there anything, obviously, you know, you said that 300 blackouts good to that one, 100, 150 range. And I mean, Listen, well, well I, I shouldn't say good. At 300 with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I shouldn't say good. I it's, it's ideal. Yeah. I should yeah. say ideal for that, that range. Yeah, because yeah. I've shot it to 1,000. But yeah. I've killed stuff to 300. Sure. But if it's up to me, yeah. 150, maybe 200, depending on the barrel length I'm shooting with, if I'm hunting, yeah. is a shot with super. And 100 is generally the maximum shot I'll take with subs. Got it. Okay. Wow. If, if I want to ensure a kill. Yeah. Is anything like extreme long range or anything like that on, on the tip of your mind or anything like that, that you might think you'd like to dabble in? Cause no, you know, well, you, like I said, with the fix and all that, and obviously you've got great accuracy with that and, a, and an awesome gun and you can get some distance with that. Uh, but going, you know, like beyond that, like we're talking like a mile, something like that, you know, like, is there mm. anything that you would, does that tickle your fancy at all or not really? Uh, well, I'll say a couple of things. Um, Yes and no. Mm-hmm. We like we've shot eight six to two miles, but that's just well, that's just for to do it in Doppler radar. Oh, so, okay. Because we're trying. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's really like, well, yeah. just just so we can really verify what's going on. Like fast twist does a lot of things. The bullet doesn't drop as much. Right. So like the applied ballistics app can't calculate the drop. It's not as much as the app will do. Right. So. And also spin drift. It doesn't calculate it correctly. So we have to shoot Doppler radar two miles. And so we can get all this data okay. right? because this is very new, super fast to us. So yeah and no, um, I am interested in it just because it teaches us a, a lot of things about shooting a shorter range. Right. Um, I really genuinely care about a thousand yards and in for any hunting mm-hmm. because yeah, I mean, you know, those Canadian snipers shot a bunch of dudes at whatever it is, oh, yeah, like a mile. Super far. Yeah. Two, yeah. two and a half miles yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah. But you know, it's like 16 shots before they hit the first guy. Right. Like, I could probably do that. Like, <laughs> Accuracy through volume. Yeah. Looks good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, I mean, and that's not to take away from those guys. It's no, incredible. Yeah. But that is such a remote possibility. Mm-hmm. That's just not the thing that we're kind of into. Like, yeah. I want to make it easier and better and a capability within actual 
a use case for people hunting, commercially shooting, or our soldiers. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, those guys, if those were our guys, you just call in a drone or you call in an airstrike and kill those guys. JDAM. Right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Like, whatever. And, you know, and it's something, too. And I, I don't want to pretend that, like, I think here's what separates us, again, from other companies or design groups is I'm willing to fund it mm -hmm. right. at, at a personal peril. And my guys are willing to put in the work and they appreciate me funding it. Cause a lot of them have worked at the other gun companies mm -hmm. and they appreciate what we do. But you know, when we talk about fast twists, you know, how we ended up realizing that the rotational energy put energy on target and we were increasing muzzle energy was we're just chasing, disp we knew that spinning the bullet faster, the subsonic bullets, we could get better accuracy. Right. Yeah. But then what happens, we get down to like one and three, we're like, shit, we've got to start shooting the supersonic bullets. Because, you know, you go ask half the ammo companies here, they'll say, oh, one in three, the bullets come apart. <laughs> Their own bullets. Right. And they don't. They've yeah. just never tested it. Right. But to them, yes, they would come apart. It's like you get a lot of that with engineers, designers, or people who are experts. Mm. Well, they're really the only way to do it is go and confirm it. You know, and that's right. why I actually started hunting. Okay. was just, what, 300 blackout. When we developed 300 blackout, well, if they're going to send this into combat, I want to go kill stuff with it. Right. And so I started culling deer on my farm. And that's actually how I started hunting. And then I found a passion for hunting. So mm. it's different for me now. But that's why I started shooting animals. Because, you know, white-tailed deer or pigs are like the closest thing to human size that's available. Mm. And so I started doing that and doing autopsies on them. Anyway, back to eight, six, and fast twist. We start going down. So we take all the supersonic bullets and we start shoot. We shoot groups first. Like, right. Well, fuck, we're shooting groups. No bullets are coming apart. So that's pretty jam up. Yeah. And so then we started shooting jail. We high-speed video everything we do. And then the jail, the first round we shot with supersonic. Now, I remember it was a 210-grain Barnes bullet, a TSX supersonic. And we shot it with 1 in 10. Looks pretty normal, like 308, whatever. Yeah. We shoot it with 1 in 7. You could tell it was a little better. We shot with 1 in 3, and the initial wound cavity was three times what one in seven was really wow. wow and we're like holy shit and we repeated it and repeated it and repeated it and so then i just went straight away to south texas and shot a bunch of deer and pigs yeah and they reacted the same way the jail did wow. that's where i've shot so many animals with eight six now and i've tested bullets from all the manufacturers ones we've developed and in testing you know we're always testing the limits right mm -hmm. so half the time stuff doesn't work and that's just part of testing mm -hmm. and I've shot so many animals with eight six now. If the bullet doesn't expand, I can tell you as soon as it's impact. Wow, because mm. you know you know the effect it has on target. Yeah, yeah. because I've shot animals with three thirty eight Lapua mag, three hundred Norm mag, three hundred Win mag, and you shoot a deer at close range with those. It's very different than if you shoot them with a six five. Interesting. Mm. And that is the reaction that you get with eight six. So that <laughs> rotational velocity and rotational energy is rushing stuff and yeah. that's how we're able to do it and yeah. that's how i've shot 12 cape buffalo with eight six yeah Fuck. so Jeez. and that's all and that's nine yeah. to 51 yards like it's yeah. dangerous yeah and that is dangerous because they fight back <laughs> yeah i mean they and it's different than other animals like a buffalo just by its nature wants to fuck you up just right. just because and so it you know and i always have a ph with a backup and i test stuff but i've shot them with subsonic and supersonic but you know, guns five pounds or less on Cape Buffalo. <laughs> How cool is that, man? I, I, no, no, dude, this is this is such a great conversation, great topic. Because, like, again, I, as I go back to what I was talking about before, the how many hundred years or so innovation, you know, firearms were relatively stay the same. And then here you are just saying, okay, well, we've already got some good stuff out on the market. You know, we don't need to like redesign the wheel here, but let's just see if we can take some things, play with this, play with that. And then now we've got this beautiful collaboration of two things that we're changing that's coming together and making something really cool downrange. Yeah. Well, when you think about, we've had Browning and Stoner right. and Jim Sullivan, a lot of brilliant guys in the industry, but we laugh every couple of weeks in engineering that mm. how did no one ever pursue fast twist? Yeah. But you know, the reality is like I was saying, it's not that we were necessarily like so brilliant. We knew it right away, but you know, we had the grit to go down the road and then, mm. Oh, we see something unusual. Let's investigate it. And right. it, you know, and it takes freedom for my engineers and a lot of resources. And so we actually found that fast twist rotational energy just by, you know, not mistake, but just by chance, because spinning the bullet fast for accuracy with subsonic. Yeah. And, you know, 
mo- most people that own companies, for profit companies, that's what they want to profit. Yeah. You know? Right. Right. And so you're not going to, you know, I mean, I don't, Ethan Lassar is probably the best engineer in our industry and he's in charge of this. He's in charge of, he's the VP of engineering at my company and in charge of special projects. Mm-hmm. And he has spent three years only doing this and it's cost me millions of dollars <laughs> and I'm not an ammo company. So it's not like <laughs> I don't get a royalty when, you know, Winchester starts making eight, six That's blackout right. ammo. It just costs me money, right. but everything we learn with that. Okay. So it's brand equity mm-hmm. and then, you know, it's relationships with the military and then our own satisfaction, whatever that's worth of a new capability, but we can sell guns and silencers, but it's, it's free for all the other companies. Yeah. You know, they get to benefit cause they get to make silencers and they get to make guns in this cartridge yeah. and we got zero funding for it. And the smartest guy we have in our industry, it's always worked on. Yeah. But, yeah. Wow, man. So, have you noticed uh, whenever you, whenever you tested like three hundred blackout eight six all that all mm. that all that fun stuff you know with your suppressors I'm I'm sure to you you've tested with you know contract suppressors things like that too mm. and 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 all that did did you notice a deviation in performance when when shooting suppressed versus unsuppressed subsonic versus supersonic suppressed and unsuppressed did, or is it has it all pretty much kind of maintained the same slight point of impact shift you know, I, I'm you, just curious your question is it, with different silencers. Yeah, well, with with your silencer or just even the rounds themselves, like three hundred, like let's say you take your preferred oh. three hundred blackout, your preferred eight point six for whatever your duty might be. Yeah, you'll yeah. see a difference in all of them. Yeah. And, and and to me, like if you look at our silencers, like when you talked about us being copied earlier, it's like, well, everybody's silencers were inch and a half diameter with an external tube. Yeah, you know, five or six years ago, we all did right. inch and three quarter tubeless circumferentially welded. Now everyone does that. Yeah, um, but you'll see things with us like. A larger bore than normal mm-hmm. and that's not an accident you know what that also does it's lets a lot of gas out the front so less Vent blowback it. right and then also if you get this you know some misalignment to some degree the bullet's not too close to one because even if you don't get contact with your baffles or your end cap if the bullet is too close on one side it really affects your dispersion and your point yes. of impact shift yeah uh-huh. so when you look at our cherry bomb which is uh-huh. a, a ridiculously loud <laughs> stupid thing yeah. but you know we use muzzle tapers we don't use shims we don't use glues which the tapering that's the other thing too that is such a genius thing we can talk about that later yeah, yeah. so but you know that all, all this was just you know, we come to taper because we wanted to make a full auto light. You know, it's originally on the Honey Badger. Now mm-hmm. even HK uses it, yeah. and that's probably a pretty good sign of success. Like when HK copies something you do, you probably <laughs> do something. Right. right? Yeah, I'd say but, so. Term yeah. of endearment at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? and, and the cherry bomb, we just so we wanted the best alignment possible. Yeah. And back when we were making three thirty eight silencers at Advanced Armament for SOCOM, and that's one of the biggest contracts I ever had. Wow. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Um, they wanted, I wanted to make a direct thread taper back then. That's when we were doing the honey badger. And they said, no, we're, we need a fast attach cause guys only use it 20% of the time. And I was like, mm, cause they've never had a good silencer. You know? right. They didn't listen to me and uh, their shims cause you have to time the muzzle break and the mm-hmm. silencer attaches yeah, to it. Yeah. You don't want all those tolerances and additional weight if you don't have to have it. But what we found was we have different thickness shims to mm-hmm. help you time the muzzle break. And so we'd put a Sharpie on each shim, like the ones that are whatever, two thousandths thick, they get green. The next ones get red, blue, yep. purple. And yep. what we'd find is the armors, if they had to use a lot of shims, they just would always seem to do it. Put the magic marker mark on in the same spot, so maybe 12 o'clock. If they put them all in the same way, it would give you misalignment up to 30 thousandths at the muzzle of the silencer. Oh, wow. Just the magic marker mark. Wow. And so this is shit that like the average company that, Oh, I can make a silencer just as good as him. Yeah, maybe you can. Yeah. Right. But you know, so that's when we started really working on the tapers and we did something like the cherry bomb. Cause really use a silencer. All right. Yeah. And the cherry bomb, there's no shims. There's no glues to fail you. It's a taper and a taper and it just need to be the lightest, most compact, a muzzle device possible to mount your silencer to and an effective enough muzzle break where you could shoot the gun. Yeah. And that's the goal. I, and, and also I think it's, I think the cherry bomb is actually super smart because it'll make you want to buy one of the suppressors. So, yeah. So yeah. The funniest thing is <laughs> totally. when we, you mentioned that like people always talk about, Oh, QD. Oh, we need QD. Yeah. What, what, what does it mean QD when you don't have to fucking time it? 
or when it's a bunch of threads. Yeah. Like uh, people just aren't honest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, that's yeah. the, what everything should be is a tapered muzzle and thread. And you, you don't, there shouldn't be QD silencers. I don't believe, I think it's dumb. All right, so I mean, honestly, I prefer to shoot suppressed anyway. I mean, I, I totally get the yeah. mindset like it's it's just shoot suppress. Well, you shoot more better suppress. It's a more elegant That's way all, of life. It is. <laughs> it's, a, it's a more yeah. refined. It's a gentleman's thing to do. You know, uh, yeah. Pinky out. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. I mean, you're a better neighbor, and nine times out of ten, you're going to shoot better with a silencer. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's lots of advantages, but I, I don't believe in QD. I don't like it. Um, so we do the bare minimum, right? That'll fit that requirement. Yeah. Um, and I've seen it with countless military, like tier one groups all around the world that we've worked with. You know, whether they use they've never used a silencer in this type of weapon system or platform, or they have, once they get a good one and it works reliably, they use it a hundred percent of the time. Oh yeah, of oh. course. And, and all my buddies that hunt, like, you know, my neighbor at my ranch, this old dude, like. Once I gave him a silencer and set his gun up, and he was like, why the hell didn't I do this 30 nice. years ago? He won't shoot anything without a silencer. Right. So, question for you. Yeah. Honest opinion. Mm. Flow through. Hot or not? Like, is it, no, or is it, it just bullshit? It's, it's, it's what I was talking about earlier. It's like, it's loud. You need ear protection. Yeah. There is still blowback. It's expensive. It's heavy. It's not durable. And that's why we did the captured flow through. Yeah. Like, you might need to relieve some of the back pressure for the gun to function, but it's just all a marketing gimmick. And, and they, they would be out of business had they not gotten that one M110A1 or whatever contract. It's, it, it's bullshit. Wow. It'll go away. I mean, when you got a gun with a silencer and it's just as loud as an unsuppressed gun, why the hell do you need a silencer? <laughs> like, Baxham didn't name it like a, uh, you know, a, a back pressure not – any gas in your face device name it a fucking silencer it's like it's what you need is you need you need it to suppress the signature <laughs> yeah flash and sound like oh you're worried about a little gas in your face well clearly you've never been shot at <laughs> like that's you know all these wow. things are important but no i think it's total crap because mm. uh, here's the thing Hux works or and i have nothing personally against them right. yeah. like i don't like i think marty daniel's a dirtbag yeah. i don't think like Hux works, those guys are all nice. I like them yeah. fine. Yeah. Like I don't have a personal issue with them. So it's nothing like that. But it's misleading consumers, and I don't like that. Because here's the thing. We could take any silencer. My yeah. M4 2000 from 20 years ago, the Trash Panda. If you take that, and we could do this. Maybe this would be a good video for you. Yeah. <laughs> take a Hux works silencer okay. that's optimized for whatever the fuck they say it is. We'll take a Trash Panda. Yeah. Let's put a half-inch hole through the bore. Okay. That's all we do to it. Yeah. You will get exactly the same back pressure, exactly the same gas in your face, and exactly the same muzzle flash and exactly the same um, sound levels as you will with that. So why do you need to do all that stuff? It's gimmicky. It's bullshit. Wow. And that's not just our silencer. Yeah. Take any silencer and put a half-inch hole through it and shoot 5.56 five, through it on the same gun and measure all that stuff. It's the same. But ours will be lighter and more durable and all these other things. So, yeah, I, and you'll get better accuracy and dispersion because there's a whole lot more air around between the bullet and the baffle. Right. Mm. So, but everybody buys into this bullshit. <laughs> like, I, like, I can say it and people say, oh, I'm a hater. Or, it's not my can. I'm just like, no, it's not. I can make flow through silencers all day. I got 3D printing machines. I got a whole machine shop. Wow. Can y'all do me a favor? Yeah, what's that? <laughs> Please put a wrench flat on the muzzle device for me. We have some coming out. Thank you. Okay, cool. <laughs> and the only reason why I say it is in our room, yeah, our somebody. Room. We always lose the damn socket. It, it, no, it got <laughs> stuck. Oh, and I was just to, like, oh, my too. God. We, well, that's because y'all are using barrels where it's not tapered. Yeah. Or you're not installing them correctly. Well, that, the that's how, it, that's yeah. how we got it off. Yeah. That's how we got it off. Yeah. It was literally... A tapered barrel, and I said, yeah. watch this. Watch it work, and it literally unscrewed. I was like, That's science. This. That's science. <laughs> but, I mean, it happens, and we're going to do them. But the thing is, if you follow the instructions and torque them properly, that it'll never come loose, even mm -hmm. on 90 degree. But it, I, I get it. People don't. And so we resist because we try to hold everybody to our standard. And <laughs> I got them selling on the commercial market. So I hear you. Thank you. And those are coming out. Oh, good, good. Oh, oh my, my God. God. So the tapering too. So 
Yeah. And that's that just makes sense, right? Like you yeah. just you just you just saw that like why don't why don't we just do this, right? Yeah, because the goal we had to meet a weight requirement, so you couldn't have QD stuff, mm. and then. Uh, you know, using glues and sh- all these things are bad. Right. And so why wouldn't you taper the muzzle? It's just like all machine tools are tapered, like in your chucks and your lays and your mills. Right. And, and that's how you get precision. Tool. Yep. And our tape, and, and it's not just a taper and, th- you know, having a taper and a thread. It's, you have to match the thread to the taper you mm. pick. And there's two things. Like ours, spend a lot of time on it. So, and it should be the standard, and we open source it. Anybody can use it, and you should. Yeah. Like, I don't want to charge manufacturers for it. You should use it because you offer, even if I don't like you, if you're Marty Daniel, all right? <laughs> Fuck. And, and, <laughs> and Daniel Defense. Like, they employ a lot of good people, and they have a lot of great customers. And, and, and I do honor Marty in the fact that he came up with a line of ARs. It was a little more premium, and, mm-hmm. you know, so he's done a lot of good things. I just think, like, it's a little morally corrupt. But... With that, he should put the taper on there. We open source it. He should. He'd provide a better product to his consumer, who also some of those are our consumers. And you, mm-hmm. I want you guys to have the best stuff. The taper is just better. It just is. But you have to calculate it correctly because you got to have the proper thread and taper together. Like ours, 20% more torque to remove it than to install it. So I can install it by hand where you got to have a wrench to take it off. That's good because then yeah. you can shoot full auto and it never comes loose. Right. And it's like that that company CGS. So they, you know, all the companies now copy the cherry bomb in our mounting, the quickie <laughs> mounting system, whether it's CGS or Dead Air, and they'll say, "Oh, we did it left hand." Like, oh, and there's another thing: left hand threads. Stupid. It, it's stupid. It's it doesn't stupid. keep anything tight. It Vibration doesn't. is what loosens everything, and it's just like bullshit. People believe this left hand. It's it's just urban myth. No, oh, yeah. Left hand threads do not keep anything tight. People. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you have right hand, right. None of that shit. It's just vibration. So it's just you torque the shit on properly, it doesn't come loose. Anyway, <laughs> CGS, that they copy ours, oh, but don't want to so exactly copy our mount. So mm-hmm. they're using two cores of a thread with not a shallow enough taper. So they're, they're, they're size six, whatever they call their can. Yeah, and you, you know what it's called. They, yep, size they, six. They, yeah, co- yeah. they come loose. Shoot that thing rapid fire full auto. They all come loose. And also, there's a reason we don't coat our muzzle devices. You coat the muzzle device and the silencer. Oh, that friction. Ooh, the silencer's just come loose. Yeah. Fuck. So we, we don't do shit on accident. That's it. Kevin, Bre- <laughs> Kevin Breddingham, Q. We don't do shit on accident. <laughs> yeah. That's a patch next year. Yeah, that's got to be a patch. Do, that's got to yeah. be a patch. I mean, right. I, I just prefer people actually, like, I will give even our competitors. Yeah. All that stuff, I'll give it to you. Just contact us. Don't don't have your dude, little Josh at CGS, who's not an engineer. Don't have him design your shit and mm. don't test it. Yeah. Because now we got because it affects me and it pisses me off. Because you buy a silencer, you pay whatever twelve hundred dollars this fucking silencer. Yeah. It's heavy. Oh, it's not as quiet as I thought. M four two thousand is quieter than it is. And then the damn thing comes loose. So now you don't want to buy another silencer because you spent all this money and time. And it doesn't do what they say. So wow. that's why these companies piss me off. It's not that they're taking money from me. Right. Like There's a big enough market for all of us. I don't care. Don't do dumb shit. <laughs> Fuck you. Never again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, that, I mean yeah. and yeah, I mean, that's my irritation with everyone. Because I know, like, I, I'll go back to that last five yards. Mm. I know what it takes to do it. Like, yeah. you, you don't get that shit for free. Yeah. And... We'll open source all of that, just like Q-Cert, our mounting system, yeah. the quickie mounting system for the silencers, our muzzle taper, 8.6. All the shit we do is open source free to anyone. You can have it. I didn't know that. We, oh, we provide cool. drawings. They're on our website. You yeah. can, we provide drawings, everything. We will help you. Make good product. You know what that tells me? Hmm. It's not even a confidence. It's just it's like I challenge you to help me change the bar. Yeah. I'm giving you I, all of our stuff. There it is, right there. Or, or, or try and do it. Try and try and do it better. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. I mean, I'm fine with that. If you do it better than me, then I'll copy you. Fine. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I mean, everybody's so full of shit. Like that's just, I'm not. Oh, dude, I love that. I love that, man. So it's just like, well, you think about the fixed rifle, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's very new and different, and that's you know that's an eight million dollar project. Yeah, well, the I'm so glad that Sig copied it. You know, and listen, we moved a mile away from SIG to recruit people from them. Mm. <laughs> so it's all fair. 
But what they did was just in typical kind of SIG commercial product, Ron Cohen fashion, mm -hmm. we, we're, we're going to stop at the 15 yard line. And there is nobody. The cross, I like the cross. Good gun. Yeah. It's fine. But what they did in copying that and trying to say it's the same, but it's this category of gun. I don't even know how to describe the fix or the cross to someone. Yeah. Like, we're eight years in. I don't even know how to tell you, like, what it is. I describe it as a utility rifle. It's kind of a do-all, and it's better than any other bolt action for practical use. So yeah. they do it. But, you know, they go the 15-yard line and try to cut our price in half. But there's nobody that owns a cross that doesn't want to fix. So it, like, doesn't bother me. And what they do is they spend millions advertising it. Mm -hmm. All that does is help me. So, like, sell all those guns and advertise it all you want. Then I don't have to. I mean, it, it is funny, though, because our comment section, when we covered the SIG Cross when it first came out, <laughs> they're like, oh, you mean the Q-Fix? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, but, I love it all where it's like yeah. Kevin designed it there and then left and started q to start to to do it and or the cross was first and kevin copied that it's like you bunch of stupid idiots <laughs> <laughs> have you ever gone through like reddit channels and just read some shit and just be like what the fuck is this sometimes i didn't know what reddit was until about six months ago but people would send me stuff from it and here, here's what i'll say is i've been this is my 31st year in the industry right. i've been going to shot show every year all these <sighs> things do events Oh. No, no one has ever said anything to me to my face. Now, do we just have when that I see Marty? Yeah. Yeah. When I see see Marty Daniel, I say "fuck you, Marty" every year, no matter who he's talking to. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Yeah, I, like he's a piece oh of God. shit. So, you know, so I am who I am. But all, all these, but uh, e even yeah. more so, the internet is funny because I don't have like I post under my name. Like yeah. my, my social media is my name. Mm -hmm. I don't post anonymously, and. You know, I, I have a lot of peers in this industry, and we talked about, like, Chris Barrett, someone that I love. Yeah. Like, I know what my peers say about me. Yeah. You know, so, so, like, if you're anonymous and you post some shit online, and that's even okay. Like, maybe you need to be anonymous because of your day job. What have you done for me to care about what you think? You know, or, or what have I done for you to think I care about what right. you think? Mm -hmm. But if you're anonymous... And most likely you're a 21 year old kid that stays on Reddit and you've never done anything in your life. Uh, it's a cool opinion, but you know, you're wrong because I was there when I did it. So I know, but <laughs> that's, that's good. I know. was there when I did it. Cause I know. So, <laughs> all right. I, you know, just because I feel like a lot of people watching are going to be interested and are going to be curious. What's, what's, what's the hate with Marty Daniel? So Marty Daniel is from my family's from South Georgia. Yeah. And one side of my family's from the same county he's from. Yeah. Okay. And Marty Daniel, you know, he used to hang garage doors. That was his business. So he's a pretty successful entrepreneur in general and had a good business. And he started doing AR stuff. Marty and I were always friends, you know, and we have a kind of connection. Our families are from the same place, you know, a small, poor area of South Georgia. And, uh, when we started Q, I told Ethan Lassard, the head of our engineering, mm. hey, we need this many engineers. What do you think? Yep, go and hire them. So Mitch Bruzy was one of Ethan's interns for two years, his last two years of college. Mm. SIG hired him in 2014. And about two months later, we had a massive layoff. We laid off 300 people. And in two years, we laid off a total, I think, of 900 or 1,200 people. Wow. Thanks. Excuse me. So in the first round of layoffs, Mitch was brand new. He was laid off. Brokenhearted. Only wanted to work for Ethan. Only wanted to work at SIG. Needs a job. Goes to Daniel Defense. Gives a job at Daniel Defense. Less than 18 months later, we start Q. So I, I didn't, I'd never met him at that point. I didn't even know he worked at Daniel Defense. I didn't know who he was. Um. Ethan offers him a job. He accepts. Marty, Daniel Defense, finds out. So he's 23 years old, the only degreed engineer at SIG, or at, uh, not at SIG, at Daniel, Daniel Defense. Defense. And he accepts a job. It's coming to work for us. Marty's attorney sends him a letter oh. saying he'll sue him for a non-compete. And at the time, and Georgia doesn't even force these at that level now, because a non-compete is usually only for, like, a key personnel or salespeople and stuff like yeah, that. Right. So he's a 23-year-old kid, no experience. Right. And so, you know, Marty and I are friends. I 
send him a, a text. Doesn't text him back. I call him, get his voicemail, say, hey, Marty, just want you to know um, the kid we're, this kid we're hiring, I didn't know he even worked for you. I explained to him what I explained to you. He's Ethan's intern, went yeah. to work for you, and he wants to come work for us. And just want you to, you know, let's talk about it. I'm not poaching him. I didn't even know he worked for you. But I understand it's a sensitive thing, so never heard from him. Files a lawsuit against Mitch. A couple months later, Mitch gets this letter. He's panicking. He's a kid. Yeah, right. And I'm like, don't worry about it. I got you. Call Marty again. Leave a message saying, well, what the fuck are you doing? Like, he's a kid. Like, And at the time, we weren't even building ARs. Right. Like, we were just building the fix. So I'm like, <clears throat> we don't even. And all they built were ARs at the time. They weren't building bolt guns or handguns or anything. Right, so it's not like your product was even cost yeah, no yeah. contaminated. And, and yeah. so I said, hey, you know, I don't even know what he's working on at your place, and we would never ask him, but no reason for you to fucking ruin this kid's life. Just call me. We'll sort it out, mm-hmm. you know, and never call me. Goes through with the lawsuit. Small town court. We go down there. Me and wow. Ethan have to testify. Marty has to testify. When Mitch is testifying, the judge is ordering stuff on Amazon. You can see his computer screen. So, and we didn't find out until the trial, till we heard at the trial, Mitch was working on a 17 HMR conversion kit for AR-15s. Like, some stupid shit we'd never do anyway. And I will say this, whether it were my brother, because I value, well, well, number one, the integrity of our business. Right. Um, and I know what it takes to build a business. And listen, I don't like Marty, but, you know, anybody that's got, you know, the balls to start a company and grow it and sacrifice, so I honor him in that regard. Sure. If Mitch had walked into our place with drawings or anything from Daniel Defense, I would have fired his ass on the spot and called Marty right away and told him. Right. I would have helped Marty to fuck him up. Yeah. And I don't know Marty's shit. And he doesn't owe me anything. And it's fine. But so never responded. We have to go to this hearing. We did this trial. Ethan and I both testify. And then Marty wanted to talk to me at the trial. Comes up to me, Kevin, how are you doing? I was like, get the fuck out of my face. Yeah. Like, fuck you. Been calling you for a year. I've spent a quarter of a million dollars defending this kid so you don't wreck his entire fucking life. And this could have been a conversation we had. Like, don't right. ever fucking speak to me again. But the worst part is his CFO at the time, and I think, you know, since Marty's gotten in trouble and no longer, you know, the CO at Daniel Defense, uh, he had a guy named Roger Mustion who was a CFO and COO. And that's important for this reason. When Remington, you know, when I sold Remington, my company worked there two years, they fired me. I had to sue them, and I won. They owed me $10 million bucks. And at trial, three people's testimony, three people were dismissed from testifying for perjury. And the fact that in federal court, you don't get prosecuted and put in jail for perjuring yourself is fucked up enough. So one was a guy named John Stevens. He was a retired FBI agent that, they, that Freedom Group hired to set me up. Another was Jason Schauble, who was my boss at Freedom Group, who then went on to do, he was a CEO at Tracking Point and then Silencer Co. for a little while. And uh, the third was Roger Mustion. Roger Mustion, who until recently was Daniel Defense's COO and CFO, was head of compliance at Remington. And his testimony, and he were dismissed, and, and you can read it in the 117-page judge's order that's online, from testifying for perjury because he forged documents in my my trial, which in the end was great because it helped me to win. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. So, and he just such a fucking idiot. Like, he forged them one and signed my name. It was with a stamp that they had to do ATF forms, but it was while I was suspended. So that's okay. kind of how it all came. <laughs> He's wow. dumb. So anyway, <laughs> then he has to leave Freedom Group. Marty hires him. So go back to Mitch's trial with, with Marty Daniel. They provide all these documents to the court, these forged documents, where they had promoted Mitch three times and he was the head of engineering. He had never had a promotion, never had a raise. And the judge rules in their favor, Mitch can't work for 18 months. So he lives at my farm. I get him a job at a machine shop as a machinist. And it cost a quarter of a million dollars, and he caused this kid to get ulcers for, like, no fucking reason. And was he legally okay to do it? Yeah, probably. And he got this small-town judge where he's, like, the biggest employer to... Right. Rule in his favor, but they forged stuff and he fucked this kid's life up for a couple of years for no reason. So I think it's a piece of shit. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's not something I wouldn't do it. No one that I care about or would spend time with would do it. And so it was just shady as fuck. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what happened. 
Yeah, well, I mean, fair enough. Jeez. So, I mean, I'm glad I asked because I was just curious, right? Yeah. I, just like everybody else watching, I'm sure they're going to be like, all right, so what the... F-? I mean, because obviously there's, you know, been been some uh, some things about Daniel Defense, too, about, like, 2A stuff or whatever else, you know, because the guys that I know, like Johnny and all them working there, whatever, these are great dudes that are pro-gun and everything else. So it's like, it's unfortunate. Yeah, that, there's a lot of good guys yeah, that yeah, work and, there. And that's that's everywhere. You know well, I mean? when Mitch worked there, you know, Except maybe the ATF, another but. story, <laughs> like he would never tell, but I know it to be true. So, you know, mag particle inspection for oh, yeah, bolts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's part of a mill requirement. Honestly, it's kind of stupid, but it's a, a mill requirement. So Mitch would give tours when he was there for certain people, right. if it was more of a technical thing. And Marty and Cindy would want him to show the MPI machine and show how the MPI of the bolts. That machine had never been plugged in, turned in, and no one knew how to run it. Shut the fuck up. And so Mitch would, because Mitch is a Midwest farm kid, salt of the earth, a good right. kid, wouldn't lie, so he, he wouldn't do the tours anymore. And Cindy was irate with him about it. And then it comes out later, like you can look it up on probably Soldier Systems or whatever. Marty's stamping all his bolts, MPI, and he's sending those. Everybody's all like, oh, Daniel Defense, Mark 18 shit. So he's sending those bolts in there. They were never MPI'd. And, you know, that came out. And so that was even like Soldier Systems and stuff. So, I mean, that's just shit. I'm not the nicest guy in the world. I'm not the most dishonest guy in the world. You will never see my company doing any shit like that. Yeah. If we stamp MPI, they're fucking MPI'd. Right. And if they're not... They're not stamped. Right. Which is a stupid thing anyway. They don't even need to be, but it's just another story. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> right. but I mean, th- those are the kind of things. And, right. and I think that's more common than it should be. You know, so I look at Marty like I think most of us look at like politicians. Yeah. And, you know, and I think it's gross and he's not somebody that I want to support or need to be friends with. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Well, hey, like I said, one of the story. We got it. Mm. <laughs> So coming back from that, it sounds like we need to do a Daniel Fence PDW versus a honey badger. No. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> All right, let's, let's do it. Let's <laughs> a pound, pound and a half heavier. Yep. One in seven twists, stupid. Nine degree shoulder, stupid. That maximum defense, heavy ass, ridiculous stock, stupid. His trigger is a piece of shit. Like, like well, why would you buy that gun at, at 20% of the cost? Hot um, or not. Uh, hot, sure. or not. hot or not, hot or okay. not, right, right. Okay, there you go. Surefire. I'm supposed to answer hot or not, mm-hmm. meaning like it's good or it's bad. Yeah. <clears throat> Specifically RC3. Is, is that the flow through one? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 Woo! Oh, oh that man. is the Lizzo of hot. <laughs> <laughs> It's so dumb. Oh. What's it like? Eighteen hundred dollars. You got a oh, fireball shit. the size of a Volkswagen. Oh, <laughs> so dumb. Oh. And I don't hate Surefire. They're no. cool. Like yeah. that's a stupid silence. Yeah. Oh, oh my god. god, dude. Oh my. G- oh. You, what? Wow. What else you got? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Oh man. All right. Oh. What? What's the? What's the new caliber for? Uh, what's the name? Six eight. Um, oh, the two seven seven three, yeah, two seven six point eight by fifty one, from Sig. That, yeah. yeah, the NGS, Ooh, yeah. That that that's that's a both. That that's hot and not. Okay, okay. And here's why. That's brilliant. You know, and I hired Jason Emhoff yeah. when I was at Sig, and he's the head of Sig Ammo. He's yeah. brilliant. He's the kid that did three hundred blackout at Remington. Yeah. Well, I love him. He's a great guy, and he's really really smart. Okay, the steel case head where they can do ninety thousand psi. Pressure. That cartridge is fucking awesome. I mean, right. you better have a pile of barrels because right. you don't burn them out but awesome cartridge so that's the 6.8 by 51 the 277 fury, fury. that's the commercial right? oh yeah whatever yeah. but the the brass is stupid it's just yeah, I might it's have that backwards you got it. yeah you got it. i got it okay so the low pressure stuff is dumb i mean it's it's no better than 6.5 or anything else but right. the high pressure stuff's really good so okay. that's a really cool concept yeah no sig is awesome if sig would focus on one thing at a time they would be the best at it they're just like spread too thin. Yeah, you know yeah. that's all it is. Mm. I mean, I, I mean, I believe like I think the MCX and the Spear had potential to be awesome, and I think they continue to screw them up because it's not their focus. I think their belt-fed machine gun has the potential to be incredible, mm-hmm. and they're building a facility near us in New Hampshire just to make that. It's that's all there is there. So that gun has the potential to really change the world. If Ron doesn't go stop at the fifteen-yard line again. 
which I think is what happens with a lot of their products. You know, yeah. 365, the, the kid that designed that, he's in charge of engineering now, Adrian. That gun's awesome. Right. You know, and if Ron doesn't try to squeeze every penny out of it, that gun will be incredible. But, you know, you see them introduce stuff when they shouldn't or change things at the last minute and have their recalls. Like, if they would focus on one thing, nobody could beat SIG. Mm -hmm. But they try to do too many things at once, in my opinion. Yeah. But so I, I would say overall that cartridge is hot, but if it's just the low pressure stuff, it's not. Yeah, yeah, it's not. Yeah, right. Oh. Right. And so, and you, and you had your hand, like I said, I think we touched on it a little bit ago, the MCX. Yeah. Yeah, right. And, and yeah. so, I mean, the Rattler and all that. So, I mean, do, is there, obviously with the Honey Badger, you, just, you preferred the DI system over like a piston driven system. Is, I would like to get your thoughts on that for a shorty 300 blackout like the rattler like the honey badger well here, here's the thing like i hear that all the time people yeah. say they want a piston i say why do you want a piston right what's more reliable no it's not yeah um it's cleaner yeah probably a little cleaner so it's a toss-up but it's heavier there's more parts more things to break so who are we making it for right. if we're making mm -hmm. it for you and instagram you're gonna shoot a thousand rounds in your life doesn't matter mm -hmm. but i will say this and, and socom testing mm-hmm the Honey Badger direct impingement was four times more reliable than the MCX. People sleep on DI. Yeah. Uh, the DI is, yeah, it gets dirty, but the damn thing runs dirty, you know, like it goes. If you're doing it, you know, but the MCX was quieter mm -hmm. and the dispersion was better, but that's because it used a longer barrel, really. Oh, well, yeah. So um, my preference is DI. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's mine, and there's an argument for for the other, but it depends on the use case, really. Mm -hmm. And piston piston in general, not better. Yeah, there are applications for short stroke or even a long stroke where it can be better. Sure, but um, trust me, if we needed, because we worked on the MCX, if we needed to do a piston gun, we would. Right. It's just you get heavier, you're going to lose accuracy, mm -hmm. you're going to have more failures more expensive it's just a lot of things it's, that and it's more complicated right so yeah, I, mean, I mean that's why yeah, yeah when yeah. things are complicated it's, yeah but i don't have a hate for piston no it's no, just yeah, like actually. in a compact lightweight thing that you want to be accurate so what we've done with the boom box and with the honey badger is continuously go after reliability and yeah. durability mm -hmm. so the average di gun and the average piston gun in this situation maybe piston is more reliable when it comes to our stuff that we're working on I haven't seen it. Mm, interesting. And if we needed to do it, we would. Right, right. I mean, because, you know, like the boom box and the honey, like, th that's a whole new gas tube. That's not an off-the-shelf thing. Like no. the boom box, there's the pistol grip and maybe like the mag catch or mag catch spring are off the shelf. Everything else on that gun is unique to that gun. Right. right. It just looks like an AR. Right. Same thing with the honey badger. The honey badger, only some springs, pins, and detents are off the shelf. Everything else is unique. That's why a honey badger costs what it does. Right. And when you see like, I love Novesky mm -hmm. and Johnny Novesky, I gave his eulogy. He was my best friend. Oh wow. And that ghetto blaster is awesome, mm -hmm. but it's yeah. over a pound heavier than our gun. Yeah. And, and you have to take the weight out of all the parts to get something lightweight. You right. can't take them out of one or whatever. So it causes you to do something completely unique, which is very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, I mean, like I said, I've, I've shot the Honey Badger, and it deserves to be on my list. I was just an idiot. And it shot really, really good. Again, we I, should just do a video together. We'll go to the range, and I'll bring my Honey Badgers, and you bring all your other guns, and we'll see what's best. I mean, hey, we got a whole video room Hold full on. of them. Let's bring them. Yeah. Wait a second. Yeah, yeah. How many times are you in New, New Hampshire? Uh, what are you, the police? Oh. <laughs> 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 Who's asking? Yeah. No. Mm. Yeah, no, we'll make it happen. Okay, yeah, we'll I've got, uh, we've got, um, so we have a lab range there, so we have an indoor range if we yeah. want to do, like, high speed or anything, and then I have a 500-yard range as well. So that'd be cool. Yeah, we can do, yeah, you guys, come on, you can build guns, you guys should do that. Yeah. You can build guns, you can have the whole experience, uh, like, like, we don't, the only thing that we keep secret is, yeah. like, we're mandated by some classification, so sure, if we're working on a classified sense. project, yeah, that stuff, can, everything else that we work on commercially we show everybody everything. Like, I don't care. Like, I can show you what I'm doing. You still got to beat me at it. Right. So, right. Like, dude, that's I, st I love that, that, dude. I love that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I don't spend a ton of time protecting stuff with IP. We do have patents and a lot of IP, yeah, sure. but it's not my focus. Like, yeah. my focus is 
the technology. I want to be the most innovative and the yeah. highest quality gun company ever. Okay. Wow. And that's a lifetime goal, and maybe we never reach it, but we're going to keep getting better. And we make a lot more guns than we used to, and our guns now are way better than they used to be. Yeah. And that's not like that's not true with SIG in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And I love SIG. Yeah. But, man, you try to do a thousand things at once, and you try to produce that many guns – you better grow that quality control department. Right. right. You know, our, our QC department and engineering departments are probably the same size as companies, 10 times our size. Yeah. Wow. That's impressive. And yeah. with that, I love the idea of actually going up there, seeing the facility, get the team up there. And then you're saying build a gun. And how cool would it be? Because, you know, if you're not, if you're familiar with the channel, you know, we do a lot of gun giveaways. We've given away through the, every time we do the honey badger, you see how popular that damn gun is and people love it. And if we were to do like, let's say the boom box, but we actually, Hey, we're going to build the winner's gun. And then bam, there it is. We take it, we shoot it out to 500 yards and we have a great time doing it. And now we say, go to cfcontest.com, code word Q. <laughs> Provided that Kaya never tightens the muzzle device. But I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, if, if that's if that's what you're willing to do, man, let's make it happen. Absolutely. Yeah, that, wow. that'll be a lot of fun. And, of course, yeah, I'll build my own and, you know, swipe card. <laughs> There for sure, go. dude. So yeah. let's let's do that. Let's plan on that. We got we'll, we'll switch. You, we'll get each other's information yes. and everything, and let's yeah. plan on it, dude. And uh, honestly, this has been an eye-opening conversation. One of which I think we. I mean, if we go up there and visit, might as well just go ahead and make the mobile podcast again for part two because this this is great. In in the Q building. In the Q building. Yeah, we got a podcast room. I'll podcast y'all. There we I'll go. I'll ask y'all some questions. There Ooh. we go. That would be fun. That's what's up. Yeah, that would be up. Yeah, dude. Let's do it, man. We'll Fuck. take it. <laughs> well, I'll I'll bring my I'll bring the whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Oh wait, Ryan's got a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. All right. My one question is. Yeah. What is your preferred bear link for three hundred blackout? Mm. Mm, solid. For what? What are you doing? Let's say uh, CQB. It's probably seven one and five twists, so a seven inch one and five twist. You know, we were uh, we started with nine inch. It was a yep. seven. It was a one and seven twist. But as we went faster, then we could go shorter with the bear length. So I like it. it it's it's good all around, and I've killed a lot of stuff with it. So I have confidence in it. Well, and 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 if you want, if you use that, if you use it for home defense or hunting, um, there's a lot of great rounds out there. But we developed at the same time we we're developing the honey badger for those units the Barnes 110 and that Solid. is one of the most incredible bullets and loads ever developed for killing yep. and, and that's what I would recommend okay yeah, yeah. wow so because you know again as you don't think about the twist rate and that type of stuff right because everything that you read is like oh you get full powder burn at eight nine inches right and so it's like oh okay so that should be the optimal bear in length that's just what you would assume right but maybe yeah maybe yes. It depends. It's right? always maybe. What's that Chinese proverb? <laughs> the the guy where it's like, you know, the horse. He these horses come to his house, and he's got these horses. And oh, you're so lucky. And then his son's riding one of them, breaks his leg, and it's like, oh, you know, it's that's terrible. And he's like, oh, maybe. And then so then there's a war, so his son doesn't go to war because you know it's like this wow. whole thing. It's like maybe, yeah. Um, you know, but it depends. I mean, I think the point of that was there's just a lot of variables. And right. so when people say effective range, like, what are you trying to do? Cause I can hit a target with a seven inch through the blackout at a thousand yards, mm. but <laughs> am I trying to kill stuff or right. am I like, so when you say it, it's like, what's the thing you're trying to do? And that's right. not trying to be an asshole. It's just an important question. Yeah. Um, and, and the point of that is there's room for seven inch barrel. There's room for a five inch barrel, a nine inch, 12 inch, 16. Yeah. Depends on what you're doing. Good, good. That's great to know. Good answer, man. So, dude, this is fun. This, <laughs> this is this was this was like I said, eye opening. I really enjoyed it. Got a, got a lot of good insight on this too. And yeah. like I said, start starting the relationship here because yeah, we need to we need to get out there, man, and 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 have that range day. Build a couple guns. God, that'd be cool. And, I just really and shoot want them, man. Mini fix SD. Still, bro. I'm so bad. Yeah. <laughs> mm. It's, yeah, it's that, that'd, cool. That'd it's fun. It's yeah. it's I like things when you put them all in a package and it's just small yeah that's just me like i said you're the, one of the main reasons why i love my mcx is because of its you know small complexity and that's just me well it's uh, cool i mean a folding stock's cool it is yeah. it's 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 a, it literally fits in a bag yeah cool. yeah 
And it like is. it, but drew from, you know, the Honey Badger SD, man. Small, light. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's funny because I read some stuff. You're talking about Reddit. I saw something the other day. One of my marketing guys sent me to one of the things, and I looked at it. And it was like, the, I don't like the MCX because it beat the Honey Badger in the LVA W competition program. in the end. Mm-hmm. You know, and here's the reality. There are 14 guns. Mm-hmm. And we did both of them. Right. And so what people don't know is when that was awarded, they they came and find Ethan and I at work. Yeah. So Ethan and I were working at SIG together. And yeah. We did the Honey Badger at Q together. And they came and told us. It's like 1030 in the morning. Yeah. So the military program manager came and told us what had happened. Yeah. And Ethan and I just, we left work, went across the street to the bar and got drunk. <laughs> and we didn't know whether to be happy or sad because it's like having – your, your kids compete against one. Right. right. And for people to talk shit, it's like we hadn't touched that honey badger in five years. Right. And it was so fucking far ahead. Right. Beretta, LMT, like you name the company. There's 14 companies submitted guns. Yeah. It beat them all. Yeah. You know, and they had five years. Yeah. But so it's like, mm, we didn't know, like, I mean, we, we were happy and we're happy for SIG. And, and of course, we're happy that, you know, both of the, our projects, yeah. um, were successful right. and, and they were and you know the honey badge i mean look at it now you know like it's a brand oh right. yeah it is it its is own it, thing. It, it, it is the most i mean yeah, it's the chimera it's the most on synonymous. Right? like it's on yeah, they, cod, changed, they yeah. changed the name because yeah. they don't want them to be real gun names anymore. yeah right yeah it's the chimera right. on cod and you run the shit out of the thing i think it was a beast <laughs> but i remember the, the black mamba i remember seeing yeah. the, the video on defensereview.com and i remember seeing you coming out and somebody asked a question he was like my guy, listen, this is what it does. This is what's going on. This is how it is. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the reality of the MCX, too, is Ethan and I weren't in charge of that program. There's another guy, uh, a German guy named Robert Hurt was. Oh. And he was very German. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sense of humor was no laughing matter. <laughs> but he, he's a brilliant guy and a smart guy. But he, here's where the MCX failed. There was a maximum weight requirement. Mm. Well, the honey badger was half that weight. Wait. And that's really what they wanted. Because re- remember, originally when they wrote this, we were sole sourced. Right. And they opened it up when I was fired from Remington. Because they thought I would go back to work and I would do the gun wherever I went back to work and do it then. And that's why there was delay in this program. The program was written for me. Whether people like it or not, that's the way it was. And so we go to SIG, but I wasn't in charge of that program. They were already working on it. Right. And his mentality was the, the overall weight was like eight and a quarter pounds or eight pounds. And he made the gun that exact weight and made everything else as good as he could. Cause you know, the Germans like it needs to last as long as possible. Right. I'm like, Robert, it's called the low visibility assault weapon. weapon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's meant to be hidden. Yeah. Right. Small. And, and this is what he said to me. And this is where I knew it would fail overall. Cause it, that program has failed. And, and I'll tell you why. But he said, you tell them, because I always had a closer relationship with all those guys because right. we worked together a lot. And to me, like, I wasn't trying to win a contract. I was trying to give them the thing they needed. And, yeah. and I'm not trying to say, oh, I'm the greatest patriot in the history of the world. I was trying to say, if I did that, I knew there was crossover to commercial. And I knew they would call me back for the next thing. And I knew I got to be involved in testing mm. that I could never afford because mm. they had – unlimited money to test stuff. Yeah. And so that is so valuable to a company owner. So I worked with them nonstop. And if they wanted something, Hey, don't go the trouble. I know you trying to rewrite a contract or something. that's very difficult. You just tell me what you want. We have a relationship and I will do what I can. And I tell Robert, I'm like, Robert, this gun weighs the same as an SR 25. Mm. Yeah let's take all this weight out of this gun. And we built some prototypes and he says, you tell them if they don't like it to change the contract. Oh, wow. And that was his mentality. And and that is why it was adopted. But to me, it's failed. It's Mm. not prolific because the gun isn't usable. You deliver eight pound gun and 300 blackout. What? Listen, I love 300 blackout, but if I'm going to shoot somebody, I'd much rather shoot them with 308. Yeah. But if I got a gun that weighs four pounds to eight pounds, okay, it's, it's a different landscape yeah. and there's a use for it. And so th- that kind of sucks. 
So <laughs> that's where I didn't like that gun. Right. And you see, they went from the MCX to the Virtus. Now they're calling it the Spear Light, like third generation. And the gun still has some dumb shit about it that sucks. Mm. Like your handguard on that thing, like flex, the, put a laser on it and then flex that handguard and see where your return to zero is. Yeah. That's where you'll see on the boom box, stiffest handguard ever developed and it ain't heavy. But we know those things. And so, you know, there's things about that that aren't good. Right. But overall, I love the folding stock. I love that gun, but it took it to, you know, the 15 yard line. Yeah. Man. Oh. Well, good shit, man. Yeah, we gotta we gotta continue this conversation. Yeah. You know, I know it's been about an hour now. I think part two. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Because, like I said, all of this has been, first of all, eye opening. It's been interesting. I've been educated. <laughs> I done learned something today. You know I what saw I mean? when the light bulb went off. Oh yeah, dude. Oh, <laughs> like, just, like, like like oh man. So now and now I've got to get some trigger time on eight six. I know you lucky bastards already have. So yep. you know, that's yep. cool. That's cool. <laughs> and uh, and. Let's just let's just say I'm not far from you, and so let's uh, let's reconvene. Let's reconvene let's do it. and let's have some fun. Let's build you guys a boombox, and uh, you know let's let's give it away. Yeah. We'll probably be building a few boomboxes if I had to guess. At, at many fix us, Steve. Yeah, that's, that's, well, that's, that's going to be for Chase. Yeah, that's my thing, man. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin, thank you, man. Oh man, Absol- thank you, absolutely, thank pleasure. you guys. so much. Yeah, yeah such a awesome. pleasure. Yeah, appreciate you guys. We're gonna before. try to get in that top five with you next. <laughs> <time>. <laughs> Yeah, man. But what, one more thing, though, before before uh, you know, I think uh, did we touch on all your social media where everybody can find you and your company? Man, they'll find us. Yeah, they will. Oh, you, literally just <laughs> Kevin on. Q. And I will say this: can't tag Q sometimes, man. I'm just a small dude. You, well, you can't tag us. Yeah, like it, when you try to tag him, it says you guys don't no messages or anything. When that doesn't seem like a thing. I think our stuff's all open. All right, I don't sorry. know, unless you went on there and said some dumb shit and we blocked you. Or no, I promise you I didn't do that. Mm. No, I, I, I don't. We don't have anything like that in our settings no. that I know of. Yeah, it's, it's Unpossible by Q, right? Yeah, yeah I got them right unpossible here. Unpossible by Q with some underscores. It's, mm-hmm. it's yep. our it's, third account. They keep dude, deleting it. I feel you, man. It's Unpossible <laughs> underscore by underscore un, uh, Q. And yeah, it looks like I can send him a message if I wanted to. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've also got a way bigger following than me. So. Yeah, I don't want to say way bigger. <laughs> wait, 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 bigger. hold on, hold on. Wait, this account can't receive your message because they don't allow new message requests from everyone. Boom. That's that's it. That's it. That's yeah. weird. Where would that be in a setting? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Because I certainly not set that up that way. Um. Uh, I, I think I just said yo. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody's gonna get in there and be, and be like, "Who's this jackass?" <laughs> All right, let me see for we go. Here. <laughs> hey, just oh, want to let y'all know if you've had a problem messaging Q, we're fixing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. We might open up a box of words with yeah, that. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, we get a lot of messages. Anyway, so <laughs> Um, no, I don't see a message from what's what. So what do we do? We go to settings. I, I don't know. I have no Dear idea. Dear Instagram, if you're watching this. Yeah. Right. What the hell? Please send help. <laughs> please send help. Dude, you know, I had someone from Instagram settings and person message me about a month ago saying, Hey, if you give me a mini fix, I'll get, I'll, you know, cause they've deleted two of our accounts. One, yeah. we had like 120,000 and, you know, yeah. and I did it all organically. I was very proud because we, we would never buy followers or any no. of that dumb shit. No. And. I, I didn't tag anyone and no hashtags. So it was yeah. just all organic. And they deleted our account a couple of years ago. And then they did again like 60 days later since our third account. So I had someone like a month ago from there, like Meta, say, I will give you your account back if you give me a mini fix. It's fucking worth it. And I was like, <laughs> yo, y'all crooked ass motherfuckers. Exactly. That's how I, I said. Think. I was like, that's you, corrupt. You give me my account back and, and I will send you a mini fix. You have my word. Yeah. yeah. And then, like, about a week later, he's like, they completely deleted it. I can't get it for you. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah. So, all right. That is, that is, that is corrupt as <laughs> shit, but, you know, here we are. Yeah. Notification, time spent favor, muted accounts, yeah. zero content, like privacy. It's got to be a message request type yeah, thing or message. something like that. Message and story know. replies. Mm. Maybe, well, see, this is just Message a, controls. Yeah. Okay, your followers on Instagram don't receive. <laughs> <laughs> I don't receive. All right. That's it. Uh, oh, all right, so message request. There we go. I just oh. changed that. I don't know. One, one of them youngins that worked for him must have got tired of y'all. Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> that's what it was. I get uh, it. Other people. Messages. Okay. Oh, yeah. All these are turned off. You're right. You're Thank you're you. welcome, America. Right? <laughs> right? You're welcome, haters. 
That's yeah, it. Right. And so you know what's going to happen is your, your social media guy or whatever is going to be like, God dang it, I put that God there for a it, reason. There was a back song. <laughs> Nobody was supposed to know. Yeah, yeah, right. Nobody was supposed right. to know. I oh, mean, he just a month ago made his job way easier. And I just messed <laughs> <him up. laughs> that's why I made it way easier. Yeah. He got him muted. <laughs> Oh, man, that's too funny. Kevin, right. thanks again, man. Thank you, guys. Yeah, we'll be seeing man, you soon. what a pleasure. Thank Absolutely, you. guys. And don't forget to check in next time at the CF Podcast. God bless. We'll see you soon. Hey, remember them. Top five. That's right. <laughs>